Um, so, but I'm sure we'll learn a lot more from Alex. So it's a great pleasure for me to uh, introduce Alex Grudstein. Um, Alex is a principal engineer at um, Google. He was one of the people behind uh, OK Google, which we all take for granted, which my kid, Nora, absolutely loves. At nighttime, she's got a little Google Home that she goes to and says, OK, Google, play relaxing sleeping music. Um, so I was actually thinking about <laughs> Alex yesterday when she was saying that. Um, so Alex has been at Google for a long time. And I believe Pete, uh, Pete's actually the person who made the connection uh, with Alex. So it's actually a uh, thanks, Pete, for making that connection and bringing Alex on board. Because otherwise, if I email Alex, Alex would be like, who's this guy? <laughs> um, <laughs> So Alex, thanks for uh, being here. Really appreciate you making the time and putting the slides and the content for the students together. Um, one thing, Alex, before we get um, into the meat of the stuff, it'll be great if you could kind of explain how you got into this space and sort of like, you know, where you see the space also kind of going. So feel free to kind of share sort of your practical experience because I think that's the critical thing that uh, the students would not be able to get, right? Cool, and then with that, uh, let's welcome Alex, and I'm going to stop sharing. And Alex, you can take the screen share. It should be at the bottom of the screen. All right. Let me see. I was just saying I'm I'm an expert on Google Meet, but I barely use Zoom, so you guys will have to uh, help me out. There you go. So far, so good. So far, so good. All right. Except I can't see you guys. I thought I would be able to see you on my other screen. Okay, there we go. Um, cool, yeah, so I'm Alex, uh, I work at Google. Um, uh, yeah, I've been there for about 11 years, uh, as, as he said, thanks for the introduction. I uh, worked with Pete a little bit on his um, uh, TensorFlow Lite and TensorFlow Mobile. Um, so yeah, I guess uh, I joined Google about 11 years ago, actually just after finishing my PhD at MIT. Um, I'd, been, I'd been interested in speech recognition for a long time. Uh, actually, I guess I first got into it when I was an undergrad and I started building like a dialogue system where you could talk to this robot helicopter. Uh, the robot helicopter never actually flew, never actually worked, but we did build a really cool dialogue system where you could talk to a simulation of a robotic helicopter. Um, and yeah, I keep working on speech recognition. When I was at MIT, uh, you know, I did some fun stuff. Um, we, we built some of the first sort of web-based uh, dialogue systems that you could talk, talk to. I had a project with BMW where we uh, like put, um, uh, you know, basically put a, a voice assistant inside of their car. So I kind of realized during my PhD that like, I seem to be the person who was always making like the demos and not making the sort of like fundamental theoretical breakthroughs. So I thought uh, moving to industry might be a good idea and that, that might be something I really enjoyed. And uh, it turns out I have really enjoyed it. Um, I still really like building systems first and writing papers about them second, I guess. Uh, and um, so it's been a lot of fun. Um, at Google, I've worked on you know voice search, uh, building the Google Assistant, uh, voice typing was one of the first things I worked on, uh, you know, putting the little microphone on the keyboard. Uh, and then after a while, got uh, kind of interested in starting to think about what, what kind of speech recognition could we do putting things on device instead of in the cloud. And that's when we started building on device speech recognition and hot word detection. Um, and yeah, when we started building hot word detection, I never, you know, it was kind of like a fun thing we added to voice search. I, I guess I didn't really envision that today, like voice assistants would be so pervasive and that hot word would be everywhere. So yeah, maybe that's a good transition into my slides. Um, talking a little bit about hot word. Uh, I, I should say, by the way, if you hear me say, uh, I've stopped saying, okay, Google and hey, Google, this will probably be the last time you hear me say it because uh, we, we all talk about it all day and we set off all the devices in our house. So if you hear me say, hey, G, or OK, uh, that's, that's basically my shorthand to avoid setting off all my devices in here. Um, but yeah, so uh, why, is hey, why is hey, G important? Um, I think uh, if you look at the places we've integrated it, uh, it's in a lot of different places today. Um, mobile, of course, is, is the first place we put it on Android phones. Um, you know, we have it on Android phones, and we have it on, actually, iPhones, too. Uh, but the interesting thing is if you look at like an Android phone, uh, because it's on Android, on certain Android phones, we're able to run it 
you know, 24 hours a day listening all of the time. On iPhone, uh, you know, Siri is able to do that, but third-party applications aren't. So, uh, you know, on iPhone, we're able to just run like inside of the Google app or, or inside of the Google Assistant app. So you have this contrast of like, do I run all the time 24 seven listening or do I just run when the application uh, is open? So that was sort of the beginning, first place we started doing uh, Hotword. Um, but yeah, like I said, the place where it really became big was in the home. So when we first, uh, you know, Amazon Echo came out and then Google started releasing uh, our own line of smart speakers and smart displays. Um, and this, uh, you know, we had already been working on Hotword at the time, but uh, this was actually quite a big transition to move from the phone to the home. Uh, so the home is challenging. Uh, the home is a lot more challenging in a few different ways. So first off, it's, uh, it's far field, which means I'm far away from the microphone. So it's nice if your phone can work, you know, when it's across the room, but it's maybe not absolutely critical to the use case. But your smart speaker, uh, I need to be able to trigger it even if I'm standing uh, on the other side of my kitchen. Uh, and from the perspective of the smart speaker, it can be quite noisy. Like a lot of people will put their smart speakers, say, next to their TV, right? And then they'll sit on a couch and they'll want to trigger it. So actually the TV will be closer to the smart speaker than I will be, which means from, from the speaker's perspective, the noise of the TV is actually often higher uh, than my voice, right? So the notion of background noise um, is a little bit inverted. We're often, we're often dealing with situations where your voice is maybe not even as loud as the background noise. So that's quite challenging. The other big challenge um, is that you know, if you go and you buy your phone, it's got a lot of features. You know, voice assistants are, are on the phone are really cool, but I don't think people are necessarily like buying their phone because of the voice assistant. Like it's maybe one more feature that's selling it. But if you buy your smart, and you know, if, if you're on your phone and maybe um, saying hey G doesn't work that well for you, uh, you can still like press the button to trigger the assistant, or you can still squeeze, or you can still swipe, uh, or on Siri, you can long press. But if I buy the smart speaker and I bring it into my house and the hot word doesn't work for me, basically it's a brick and I'm gonna return it, right? So there's a huge pressure here that hot word has to work um, and has to work well enough for anybody who buys it and puts it in their house or, th or they're gonna return the device. Um, so there's a huge new pressure to just work really well in the, in the home scenario. So yeah, we have it running on smart speakers, smart displays, TVs, sound bars, third party speakers, um, lots of different places in the home. I think the other big use case for Hotword is in the car. Um, and a lot of that, actually, the vast majority of that usage is just people taking their phone and maybe in the best case scenario, taking the phone and you know attaching it to a holder. Um, so it's kind of in the front. But that's really the best case scenario. The more common scenario is throwing my phone into the cup holder or throwing my phone into the seat next to me. And you know my microphone might be occluded uh, it might be facing away from me, and uh, we still want the product to work. So uh, if you throw your phone in your cup holder, uh, that's, that's sort of one of our holy grails is like uh, you can walk into the car, throw your phone in the cup holder, and it'll, hot word will still work. Uh, of course, we've also done things like there's now uh, a line of cars rolling out that have uh, Android Auto embedded built into them. Uh, and those, of course, have hot word as well. So the, this is there's this Volvo Polestar 2 that's just rolling off right now and, and future cars coming in the future. Uh, and there's also actually these accessories you can buy for your car uh, that you can like plug into the cigarette lighter uh, and then they connect by Bluetooth to your phone. So this is another interesting case where I need to be able to run hot word on this, this little tiny, very cheap accessory uh, that plugs into my cigarette lighter. Uh, and then there's other kinds of accessories outside of the car, of course. There's watches and things like headphones, uh, which again are very challenging um, because I've got to run on these very small battery powered devices. So yeah, the, I guess the other big way to break, break this ecosystem apart is into battery powered versus plugged in. Uh, so, you know, phones obviously are battery, battery powered, watches and headphones. And most of the, you know, that brings up a whole set of new constraints being battery powered. Um, and that's, you know, that's what the paper I asked you to read talked a lot about and, and we'll talk more about today. By the way, I should say, I don't know how you guys do it, but you're welcome to interrupt with questions or comments. Talking a little bit more about 
the space in general, um, you know, my experience is, is of course around the Google hot word, but uh, there are wake words everywhere. Um, you know, Siri has one, Alexa, of course, uh, Samsung has, has Bixby, uh, you know, Facebook has this portal system now. Those are probably the biggest ones you've heard of, but there are actually probably tens or hundreds of other companies building wake words. Uh, in China, there's a whole nother set of wake words for uh, you know, the most common speakers and, and smart displays there. Um, is there any uh, stat on like how often these things are set at uh, scale? Like how often does a human typically do this? We don't think about it, right? How often does it what, sorry? How often does a user typically use these words, right? How often do they say, hey, Google? Oh, I see. Um, yeah, I mean, I, of course, know the stats. I'd have to check on what's publicly available. But, uh, you know, I think it's safe to say in terms of usage, like people use use it much more on the smart display, for example, than on the phone, right? Like, um, but there's definitely people out there using it, you know, tens, 10, 20, 30, 40 times a day is not uncommon or unheard of. Um, there's definitely definitely pretty common for people to be using their smart speakers that much. Do we see a transition sort of happening from touch face thing to increasingly moving towards these things? Uh, it's sort of a general trend wise. I'm curious if you can share something about how you uh, see this being the predominant way of interaction. Well, I, I mean, I, I like to think actually that we're at like a unique point like that. For my personal opinion is like the hot word is okay, but once you're saying it 20 times a day, it's actually pretty annoying. Um, so while it works today, I, I like to think that hopefully in the future we'll actually be out of the world where you're actually having to say it 20 times a day, right? Um, I don't know that these things can be truly pervasive if every time you want to talk to it, you have to say the hot word um, because it's just it's just tiring to do that. So. While it's, while it's great to be interacting with it a lot, I think if we really want to get to the point where people are truly able to use it um, seamlessly, we'll have to have other strategies. I don't know if that means hot words will go away, but um, you know, hopefully there'll be other ways to be able to your device. So yeah, uh, I guess further on background, just thinking about high level, what are the challenges for wake words? I mean, the most obvious challenge is of course, accuracy. Um, and accuracy is, I think of like uh, finding a needle in a haystack kind of like you need to be able to listen 24 hours a day and, but you only need to be able to trigger at the right time. So uh, it's really, you really have to think about that fact. You really have to think about that fact when you're evaluating accuracy of these systems. So I'll, I'll have people, I'll have people come to me, you know, maybe other companies with, hey, we have this great keyword spotter. Here's a demo of it. And they'll pull it out in a meeting and they'll talk really quietly or they'll put on a lot of background noise. And you know what, actually it triggers great. Uh, but what you have to do with that is you have to take that demo and you have to put it next to a TV and like watch TV for an hour and see how many times it goes off. Because it's actually really easy to make something that detects, uh, detects the hot word really well and triggers very, very reliably. But the problem is false accepts. So you need to be able to do that while also not triggering on things that sound a little bit like the hot word. Uh, so you have to be able to find the right the right trade off there. That that's really the key challenge of it. Like it seems, uh, it's it's not that hard to build something that can trigger reliably, but it's hard to build something that also doesn't trigger all the time uh, on other noise. Uh, latency is another big factor that we talk about. We think about a lot, and I don't think you see a lot in you know papers published in this area, for example. But uh, it's absolutely critical that a device be able to light up or beep or show the UI immediately. Right. Uh, if I have to say the hot word and wait a second for it for it to trigger, like that's going to feel super sluggish to me. Um, another big challenge is that we do a lot of personalization. So on your phone, for example, or on your headphones, uh, we need to trigger only for you and not for somebody else. Um, uh, that's uh, you know sort of built into the fact that it's giving personal. It can potentially give personalized information back to you. Uh, and also just to sort of avoid annoy annoyance of I'm walking around and someone else says this trigger word and can trigger my device. And then finally, as I mentioned before, yeah, in a lot of cases we're running on battery battery powered devices. And, you know, like I said, it's it's a feature of the device, It's but it's not the only feature of the device. So if you're using half the battery, like nobody's going to accept that, right? So we're, we're going to have a budget to uh, hopefully not significantly impact the battery life.
Cool, so that's kind of the high level challenges. Um, and then I thought I would go through just a little bit about how keyword spotting works. Um, a lot of this I drew from the paper and I'll, I'll bring in a few other things from elsewhere. Um, at a high level, you basically have three stages for um, keyword spotting. And by the way, I should say, I tend to use keyword spotting, wake word, hot word, all sort of interchangeably. So I don't actually really mean anything different. Uh, I guess in mostly when we write papers, we use keyword spotting because that's what people have kind of been calling this for many years. Uh, Google sort of trademark, or Google, I guess it's not trademark, but our sort of personal name for it is hot word and Alexa says wake word, but really they all mean the same thing. So the first stage uh, is the signal processing front end. So you have, you have audio coming in um, uh, and uh, you need to be able to pull out information about that audio and then feed it into your neural net. You have some kind of neural net that takes information from this front end and produces, uh, tries to understand what the sounds uh, in that audio are. And then you have this decoder stage. So let me talk about them a little bit in turn. So uh, the front end use is really um, pretty similar to just what's been used for tradi traditional speech recognition for many years, um, you know, with some tweaks here and there. But the basic idea is that you look at these little chunks of audio, typically 25 millisecond windows of audio, um, and they're overlapping. So every, uh, you look, uh, you take a step every 10 milliseconds, uh, and you look at this overlapping 25 millisecond window of audio. Uh, and you, your goal is basically to pull out what, what frequencies are strong in this piece, piece of audio. Um, so you do some sort of just traditional signal processing uh, in FFT. Uh, and FFT will tell you uh, how much power there is at each frequency. And then you do what we call these log mail filter banks. But this is really just like a fancy way to say, I want to like take little buckets of the buckets of these frequencies and figure out how much energy there is in each bucket. This law, this, this mail filter banks is, is supposed to be based on uh, human speech and it's, it spaces these buckets out in a certain way. But the, the high level idea is, okay, every 25 milliseconds, um, give, me a, give me a bucket of maybe uh, 40, you know, this is a number you can change, but something like 32 or 40, we call them channels or buckets. Uh, how, much, how much energy is there in each one of those um, buckets? And if you look at this graphically, you get a spectrogram here. So on the X axis of this is time. Uh, the Y axis is the different frequencies, and then the, the darkness or the color is the um, amount of energy in each one of those frequencies. Now, um, you know, I, I did my PhD at MIT down the road, and there's actually a group of people who get together at lunch and look at these spectrograms and try to figure out what words are being said in them. So uh, there, are actually people, there are actually people who can do this which I guess the idea is if people can do that and look at this picture, then you should be able to do speech recognition. So it's kind of a proof that like speech recognition should work, uh, but it's an amazingly difficult skill, skill to have. Can I ask a uh, question? First one. So sure. values that you're saying, right? Like the 32 to uh, 40 filter back channels in the 25 milliseconds, like what's the intuition behind this? Yeah, so the 25 milliseconds, I mean, the idea is that you need um, a small enough window that you can consider like uh, the, uh, the audio to be stationary, right? So you, you kind of want to try to choose a small enough point where you can assume that, um, you know, my frequencies are stable if I look in this, this small little window. In the, the, uh, so that, that's the basic assumption. The 32 or 40, um, I mean, those, that range comes from sort of traditional speech recognition. I think the, um, you know, when, when we've moved to neural nets, you could, you could take the output of the FFT directly, right? And you would end up with something like, um, uh, you know, you, you could end up with thousands of potential numbers depending on the, the size of the F FFT you use. And you could have your neural net, network process all of those. And that actually works fine. Um, so, but it, it may require a lot of computation, right? Now my neural net's gonna have to get really big to accommodate this huge input. So it's at this point, when you think about neural nets, it's kind of a trade-off. Like, I mean, actually you could do, I think this whole front end with neural networks pretty well. Uh, but the thing is it's super, 
like the current code we have to do it is super optimized and the neural network will actually just end up using a lot more compute to do something similar. So people have done things to go straight from, straight from the waveform to speech recognition or straight from the output of the FFT into speech recognition. Generally they work, um, I guess, generally they use a lot more computation and they haven't necessarily shown huge accuracy improvements by doing so. So people tend to stick, tend to stick more to these traditional front ends for the moment. Um, yeah, so in the, the next stage is what we call this acoustic encoder. Um, so this is supposed to take the output of this front end and the idea is to map it into um, some kind of acoustic unit. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but um, yeah, that's basically the goal of it. Uh, when you take the, the output of this front end, depending on the kind of neural net you use, you might just take it one frame or one of these 25 millisecond chunks at a time and feed it to the neural net. So every time step, you're gonna feed, feed this to the neural net and it's gonna predict, try to predict uh, like basically what sounds did I hear in that, in that window. Um, for, some kind of, for some neural nets that have memory, it might be fine to just feed that one at a time. If you use something like a DNN that doesn't have any memory or CNN, you might actually want to just stack in time. So you might take a big stack of these, uh, of these frames over time and say, okay, you, I want you to look at this one in the middle, but actually I'm going to give you, uh, you know, 100 milliseconds before and 50 milliseconds after for you to also give you some context uh, for the neural net to have. Um, and then the third stage is a decoder. Now in speech recognition, you tend to have fairly complex decoders that are doing like a Viterbi search. Uh, for keyword spotting, um, like what we talk about in this paper, you can often get away with something much simpler uh, and much cheaper, again, as a, as a way to save computation. Uh, so I think what we describe in this paper is basically just something very simple where you take one of these, each one of these, the scores you get um, for each one of these acoustic units out of the neural net and you basically just smooth that score over time. Um, and then you, you go back in time and you say, okay, you know, uh, what are the units that make up um, the hot word, like okay in Google? Like what are the different units that make that up? And what, um, I have to just go back in time and find sort of the high, highest scoring path uh, across these units that lets me uh, build the hot word. Multiply that all together and get just a single score. So at the end of the day, the goal of this thing is just to produce a single score for how likely it is that I've heard the hot word or not. So hopefully that's not too vague. That's the overall, overall picture. Um, and then I wanted to say a little bit about, um, so we have this decoder. We talked, like, we talked about how we could potentially replace the front end with the neural net. Uh, we could also potentially replace the decoder with the neural net. And, and that's something we've looked at uh, on my team as well. Um, which makes sense, like this, this decoder algorithm as we, you know, as we implemented it there is kind of just like a very cheap hacky thing. Um, and, uh, you know, it may or may not be the best way to do things. So it makes sense to think like, okay, can I actually just incorporate this decoder into my neural net directly? And then instead of my neural net trying to predict these acoustic units, it'll actually just directly output the probability of having seen the hot word. Um, so to build these like end-to-end -end networks, um, you know, we, we've tried lots of different things. You could, uh, you could train the whole network together. So, um, uh, and just try to have it directly predict hot word or not hot word. Um, another idea we tried, which, which seems to work pretty well, is you first train the encoder. Uh, and while you're, while you're training, you have this, so there's this soft max layer here uh, at the end. While you're training, you have the soft max layer and you try to, you train the encoder as you would normally to predict each of these acoustic units. And then you add in this decoder and you do some more training uh, with, the, with the, you could freeze the encoder or you could let the encoder keep training. Um, it's, it's kind of your choice on how you want to do it. Um, but then basically training the encoder first, adding in the decoder and then training some more is, you know, just practically something we found tended to work better. Um, getting back to latency, one of the, one of the things we struggled with when looking at this encoder decoder approach together is it's, it's, it's tricky to train a neural net and tell it, hey, I need you to fire really early, right? Or I need you to fire really fast. You, it, it may learn to fire, but it may learn to, to delay that decision because that actually gives it better accuracy. So you have to be real careful on 
uh, how you label the training data and, and make sure that you um, are basically penalizing it if it's firing late. Um, so yeah, in here, um, I talked about SVDF layer. So I guess I didn't talk much about, I thought I had a slide on it, but maybe I forgot. You know, in this um, neural network acoustic yeah, encoder like processing this. stuff that you all do, like you know, like you're, the examples you're giving about the background noise and things like that. Like I understand that the, the encoder decoder part, but there must be some sort of other pre-processing that's likely done uh, for background noise and stuff. You mean? Huh. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so one thing we do is we handle that during training. So I'll talk a bit about MTR. Um, and yeah, I didn't include it here, but we have also, um, we published some papers on what we call this uh, hot word cleaner, uh, which is like a multi-channel signal processing algorithm that can go in front of hot word and improve accuracy. There's also more traditional approaches like beamforming. So people, you can take a microphone array with multiple microphones and you can do what's called like static beamforming. So uh, if you imagine like, uh, something like a uh, speech system that has to run in a car. Like I pretty much know the driver will sit in the driver's seat, the passengers will sit in the passenger seat, and I can actually use multiple microphones to say, okay, I just want to, I just want to point directly at where the driver is sitting, or I just want to point directly at where the passenger sitting is sitting, and I want to consider any other sound coming from other directions as noise. Um, so there's, that's one kind of beamforming. There's also beamforming where um, you know, you try to hear that somebody is speaking in a certain direction and then you try to sort of lock on to that direction. Uh, I don't know if you ever play around with like, uh, you know, like the orig original Amazon Echo, you know, depending on where you're standing when you talk to it, it'll actually sort of light up in the direction of where it thinks the, the sound is coming from, right? So uh, maybe they're doing some kind of beamforming, beamforming under the hood there. They're certainly figuring out the direction of where the speech is coming from. You also notice if you put it next to a wall, uh, sometimes it'll think that the, the direction of sound is coming from like behind it from the wall, right? Because the, it'll actually bounce off the wall. So you can get, you know, these, these algorithms can be tricked um, if you're not careful. So yeah, that's, a, I guess, hopefully that answers your question a little bit high level. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so I should say going back to the encoder, I guess the natural question is what kind of neural net do you want to use? Um, and the short answer is like, we've tried a lot of different ones. So I would say it's kind of up to you. You can experiment and see what works best. Uh, I mean, originally we worked with just uh, deep neural networks. We've worked with uh, CNNs. Uh, you can do, it, it makes sense of course, to think about uh, like in speech recognition, uh, LSTMs, which are a kind of recurrent neural network um, have, have worked very well. So that's something uh, that we've tried there. Uh, and then, um, uh, one thing that we've published in a bunch of different papers is what we call this SVDF network. Uh, and, you know, my co-author here, Raz Raziel, is, is really the mastermind behind this. But uh, I think to start with the weird name of the SVDF uh, is this came out of some work we were doing to actually try to shrink, uh, to try to shrink our neural networks by using singular value decomposition. So the idea was you would like train your network use SVD to shrink it and then maybe train it some more. Uh, after a lot of experiments, we found that that did work. We could shrink our network that way. Um, but after a lot of experiments, we actually found that uh, if you actually just put the network in this structure that you ended up with and just trained it directly, um, uh, it actually tended to work better. So we ended up with this new structure for our network, uh, which was kind of you know through this weird process of trying to shrink it. Uh, but now we ended up just training it directly. But I guess at a high level, what these SVDFs are, are um, just a very efficient way to mix convolutions in feature, first in features and then in time and using just a limited amount of memory. Uh, and if you go back here, you can see, you know, you might stack up a bunch of these layers uh, and stacking them up is something that you can actually do to increase the, increase the amount of memory that they have. Um, so these are interesting because, um, you know, the memory is limited and for something like keyword spotting that's just running 24 hours a day, uh, that's actually like potentially a good feature. Like I don't want to, I don't want to remember necessarily arbitrarily far back. I, I need some memory, but probably just a limited amount of memory. Uh, and we've also seen uh, that some things like recurrent neural networks or LSTMs, if you run them for a long time, 
uh, they can get into these funny states uh, where they actually will just start predicting, um, they'll, they'll basically just st start outputting zeros all the time and they'll just start like ignoring the input. So you can get into these funny states with different kinds of recurrent networks. Uh, with the limited memory of these SVDFs, we found that that doesn't tend to be a problem. Um, so that's, that's another reason we, we've tended to see them as being something pretty useful to use. Um, okay, so yeah, also on the encoder, like I guess I've talked a little bit vaguely about, uh, you know, these acoustic units that it can output. So, you know, every, every 10 milliseconds, it's trying to predict like what sound did I hear, um, uh, what I've sort of vaguely called an acoustic unit. But there's actually a lot of different possibilities for these units. Uh, and there's no real right answer here on what you want to use. Uh, we've experimented with lot, lots of different things over the years. Uh, I mean, at the simplest level, you can have it predict, uh, try to predict words like, okay, tell me when you think you see hey, tell me when you think you see okay, or tell me when you think you see Google, um, which can potentially work fine. I think one tricky thing here is that like hey is much shorter than Google. So you're kind of asking the network to do something a little funny. It needs to learn to predict this very short thing and this very long thing. Um, so what you can do is try to break it down into pieces. So you might try to break it down into just little pieces or uh, sort of syllables or something close to syllables, uh, like hey and o oh and k and goo and gul. You know, you might just have those different units coming out. Uh, or you might do something that's more like traditional speech recognition. So uh, in, in, in linguistics, there's you know this idea that uh, there's a certain uh, set of sounds that uh, every language has a certain set of sounds that make it up that they call phones. Um, and that's sort of the catalog of all of the different sounds in that language. Uh, you know, of course, it's, this is something kind of made up by linguists, right? I don't know if there's, there's you know, it's one way of looking at the world, but it's a, a very useful way of looking at the world that's been used for a long time in speech recognition. So then you kind of break things up into these smaller sounds, you know, just like the H and the hey and the E and the Y uh, and the O and the K and the uh, right? Like these little sounds. Um, and then you can actually go further and say, well, actually, the way that these sounds sound are actually influenced by what comes before them or after them, right? So this is something called co-articulation. As I'm speaking, uh, based on what I've said before and what I'm going to say next, uh, I actually change the way that I make the sound, uh, the current sound that I'm trying to make just because of the mechanics of the way my mouth and my vocal tract works, right? Uh, so because of that intuition and speech recognition, they often use what's called con context dependent phones. And they say, well, I actually mean the H sound that's uh, coming after silence or the E sound that's coming after the H or the Y sound that's coming after the E. Um, so that would be what's called like a diphone because it just takes into account uh, the sound before it. And then even more typical in treat, speech recognition is what they call triphones, which is you take the phone and you say, okay, what phone comes before it and what phone comes after it. Um, so you can actually try all of these different things. Um, they, all, uh, they all work to varying degrees. Uh, and I think you can be pretty successful with, with any of these techniques. I think one key thing to keep in mind is your choice of what you want to do here uh, influences how you have to prepare your training data. So let's talk a little bit about training data. Um, I have a gonna... question. Yeah, sure. So just based on what you were explaining in the previous slide, right, does this mean that depending on the word I choose to wake the machine up, right, I can, the word itself could effectively then affect how good the, the system is. You see what I'm saying? Like, for instance, like, Alexa, I always wondered, like, why is it Alexa? I don't know if is there's something linguistic somehow they know there's some characteristics that get pronounced that are easy to pick up. Which is like, mm -hmm. hey, Google, I always wanted, like, why isn't it just Google, for instance? I mean, right. Why would you add hey? Like, are, are there reasons there? Sure, yeah. Um, I think there's kind of a magic number of three syllables. So, uh, and I think you'll see Alexa is three syllables. Hey, Google is three syllables. Um, originally, we started with, okay, Google. Uh, it's actually four syllables, right? Uh, and that was very intentional. So the longer the word is, the, the better the accuracy. Um, so if you think of like uh, a one syllable word, like stop, say, for example, is actually very difficult, um, very, very, um, very difficult to pick up. Two syllables, um, uh, 
Um, you know, two syllables is, starts to be doable, uh, but three, three syllables seems to be the sweet spot between like, it's not too many syllables to say, and the system kind of starts to work reasonably well. So definitely the, the length of the syllables matters. I think, um, uh, I think Alexa is a really good choice for a hot word, uh, starting with sort of like, starting with this vowel and then having like a very distinct, this lex in the middle and then another vowel. Uh, it's pretty, pretty easy to say. Um, and uh, it hits that three syllables, it's pretty distinct. Um, so I, I think Alexa is a very, a very intentional and very good um, hot word choice. Uh, cool, so yeah, let's see, training. Um, so yeah, to train my system, uh, to train this uh, acoustic encoder neural network, uh, I'm gonna want a lot of data, uh, ideally of people saying the hot word, um, also a lot of data of people saying other things, um, and I'm probably going to want uh, a lot of the different background noise that we, that my system is typically going to be exposed to, like music, television, car noise. Um, and I'm going to want to train my system like, okay, here are the, here are the different uh, phonetic units in this audio, and here are things that I'm, I'm explicitly not looking for. So to do that, I need to take this audio. Um, what we typically do is we have the audio transcribed, so we have somebody write down um, you know, what words are in the audio. Um, what's, what's really expensive and time consuming would be to actually like label, you know, frame by frame, little 25 millisecond chunks in the audio, like, okay, where's the O, where's the K sound, where's the G sound, right? Like that would be enormously time consuming and difficult. So, so we don't tend to do that. Um, although there are some in speech recognition, there are some very small sort of corpuses you can get that have been painstakingly hand labeled like that. But that's not something you can do at scale. So we, but what you can do at scale is have someone label what words are actually in the text. Or you can just um, ask people to read certain words and then you already know what words are in the text, right? Um, but then we need to be able to say, okay, where in the audio file is each one of these sounds? And to do that, we typically use something called forced alignment. Um, so in speech recognition, so this is basically just using my speech recognition system. Usually in speech recognition, I do this Viterbi search where I'm trying to figure out, okay, what, what is, what's the most likely sequence of words? But in forced alignment mode, I just take the audio and I say, this is the sequence of words. I want you to find the best path um, in the audio that uh, says where each one of those words is. Or, you know, so that works if I want to label words. If I want to label phones or context-dependent phones, these smaller units, then my speech recognition system has to be trained with those. And it also has to, it has to say, okay, what's the best alignment of uh, phones in the audio, like each one of these little sounds. So it's actually going to do a search to figure out, um, okay, you know, this is the highest scoring path if, you know, okay is, uh, 100 milliseconds and the Y is here, then the start of the G sound is here and it lasts, you know, uh, 50 milliseconds also. Um, so you're basically just going to rely on your speech recognition system to take the audio and figure out where each one of these sounds are. Um, and then you're going to, then you basically just have a set of frames. So you, you basically have each of your little 25 millisecond chunks and it's labeled with one of these sounds. Uh, and that's basically just my training data that I'm going to give to my neural network. Okay, here's a, you know, here's a big bucket of these frames um, uh, and go and train. And if I'm doing, of course, a recurrent network, then I'm gonna need to maybe show them, show them in sequence to the system. But if you're training something like a DNN, literally it's just like, okay, here's a bucket of, here's a bucket of frames um, and, and go learn. And the order actually is no longer even important. So I guess from a practical point of view, you know, we, we have our own tools that we use there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of open source tools too that can do this. Uh, there's a popular speech recognition system called Calby, and I think it's got this forced alignment mode if you want to play around with it. I don't know, Pete, I don't know if maybe Pete has something he used for the, uh, this open source data set he's created. Uh, no, I didn't, but I, interestingly enough, uh, Mark, who is on this call, I think, uh, is actually looking at using uh, force the alignment to extract a larger data set from the common voice data set. So, so yeah, um, you, you asked a question about noise robustness, um, uh, and that's something that uh, we try to address during training. 
uh, using something that's called multi-style training. Uh, and the idea here is to basically, you know, have these recordings of maybe people saying different words, uh, different phrases, and, um, you know, a lot of these might just be people recording them on their phone. They might not be that noisy. Um, or, you know, maybe I have a lot of data from phones, but I want to make my system work well in the car, or I want to make it work well uh, on a smart speaker, right? Uh, it's a different environment. So you can actually augment your training data with, um, uh, at the simplest level, you could just add noise to your training data and you could just, you know, take recordings of background noise. Like if I want to make it work well in the car, I could go and just go inside of a car and record a bunch of background noise of cars, like driving around with the radio on, with the windshield wipers on, um, all the, you know, all the sort of windows open, typical background noise in the car. The simplest thing I could do is actually just go and like mix that audio together with my training data. Uh, and that works okay. But if I want to do something more complicated, I could actually sort of try to start to model, okay, what does a car, uh, what is a, what's the shape of a car? What kind of material is there in a car? Where's the microphone in a car? And where is uh, the person speaking from in the car? Um, because, you know, I'm not necessarily going to speak directly to the microphone. It might actually bounce off a lot of different uh, walls. Um, uh, which is called, which will create something called reverberation, right? So the microphone will hear, uh, there'll be like a direct path from my mouth to the microphone, but the audio will also bounce off walls and arrive a little bit later to the microphone. And that's why if somebody's in a big empty room, you know, you'll, you'll hear this very echoey sound as they're speaking, right? Because you're hearing these reflections that arrive later. So uh, we can actually build a, a, a simulator that uh, lets you sort of say, okay, I want you to be in a room that's like, this dimen these dimensions, the microphone will be over here, uh, the speaker uh, of where the person is speaking will be over here, there'll be some background noise that'll be over here, um, and I'll sort of play it back and simulate it in this room, and it'll simulate sort of bouncing off the walls, and maybe, uh, you know, maybe my device has two microphones or three microphones, and each one is this far apart. I can actually simulate that uh, in the simulator and, and have the audio arrive at each of the microphones. So if I simulate all of this, um, I can take maybe potentially a relatively small amount of data, but I can add lots of different noise. I can add lots of different types of rooms. I can add lots of different sizes of rooms and microphone positions and uh, playback positions and different kinds of background noise. And I can massively augment my data. Um, and this is something that's just like routinely done now in, in speech recognition. Um, uh, became especially useful with, you know, neural nets were really able to, to start to be able to learn, learn from these kinds of uh, added noise. Um, okay, so that's sort of training. Um, the next big, big thing you have to do after you've trained a model, uh, you need to evaluate like how well does it work. Um, and we look at accuracy to do that. And like I said before, you know, intuitively accuracy is, is this trade-off between what we call false rejects. So how often does somebody say the hot word, but our system rejects it and doesn't hear it, uh, versus how many times does somebody not say the hot word and we accept it, that's a false accept. Um, and and uh, you can typically plot these as a trade-off uh, on what we call an ROC curve. So we put like on the x-axis, we say, okay, uh, how many false accepts are there? And because in this, you know, for keyword spotting, you're kind of interested in like, okay, if it hears an hour of audio or a day's worth of audio, how many times is it going to going to false accept? We measure sort of in terms of false accepts per hour of audio. So that's what we tend to plot on the x-axis. And then on the y-axis, um, you know, we just say say you have recordings of somebody saying saying the hot word, you know, like, I don't know, 10,000 10, different recordings of it. We say, okay, 2% of the time we failed to trigger. So we plot that on the y-axis. So remember the output of our decoder was some kind of score, which said how likely we are to see the hot word. So to create this plot, we just vary the threshold that we use on that score. So as we increase the threshold, our, our false um, accept rate will go down because it'll be harder to trigger but our false reject rate will go up. So we'll go, we'll go into this corner, uh, upper left-hand corner of this graph here. And as we lower the threshold, of course, the opposite will happen. It'll be, it'll be easier, we'll, we'll, we'll reject um, less frequently, but we'll accidentally accept a lot more often. Um, and then at the end of the day, you need to choose one threshold. So that's sort of 
you know, what we've highlighted here as, uh, as these dots on the graph, and this we call the operating point. Um, so this is the point where I choose my trade-off between false rejects and false success. So incidentally, like I just kind of threw a random, a random ROC curve in here. I don't know if you guys have any intuition. Is this like a good hot word detection system or a bad hot word detection system? Hmm. Well, I would say this operating point chosen uh, is actually pretty bad, right? So uh, if you look at these dots, uh, we're saying we're going to have like 10 to 15 false accepts per hour. So if I, you know, if I put my device next to a TV, maybe it'll, it'll go off 10 or 15 times. The false reject is pretty, rate is pretty good. Like this is 2%. Um, but in reality, I probably want my system to be way, way more over to the left somewhere. So, uh, you know, if I wanted to get over one, like get under say one false accept an hour, or really I probably actually want to be way lower than that. I'm going to end up going up on the curve. So it's hard to tell on this graph, but you're probably going to be shooting up over, you know, even above like 10 or 15 percent false reject rate, uh, which is a pretty high false reject rate. Like, uh, you you probably only want to be in the generally just want to be in like the single digits of, of false reject rate. Um, so yeah, that brings me to my next point. Like, we measured that, uh, you know, to plot that graph, uh, we just we have to choose some set of audio. So maybe I choose. Uh, you know, some YouTube videos or something as my negative data set. And maybe I have, uh, you know, uh, 200 recordings of myself and that's my positive set. Like I could create a graph from that, but it might not actually tell me much about how the system works in the real world. So in the real world, um, people use their systems very differently. Like I might keep my phone in my pocket all day. Uh, someone might have it in their purse or their backpack. Um, some people might put their smart speaker next to a TV. Some people might put it in their kitchen right next to where their family's always eating and talking, or they might put it in their bedroom where there's really very little noise most of the time. Um, and like, as we talked about before, uh, you know, you, uh, uh, you might not be a native speaker of English, so you might have an accent. It might be harder for you to, for you to trigger the system. Um, so really, uh, each individual person is going to experience the system pretty differently, um, depending on factors like this. So, you know, one thing we released uh, recently was this ability that you could actually kind of tweak your operating point yourself. So this is called like a sensitivity feature. If you, if you dig into settings for your, for your smart speaker, you can actually go in here and say, well, uh, gosh, gosh, it's really hard for me to trigger this. I'm, I want to make it more sensitive. Or, you know what, this is, tr this is going off all the time when it's not supposed to. So I, I want to make it less sensitive. So you can actually go in and, and manually adjust this if you want. Um, cool. So that's kind of overview of keyword spotting. Uh, and then I know the focus of this class is sort of on tiny, tiny ML and maybe worrying about things like battery power. So let's talk a little bit about cascade architecture. Uh, and uh, that was, you know, the whole point of this paper was, okay, what do we need to do to make this system work on a battery powered device, basically? And supposedly cascade architecture was, was the answer, but why was it the answer? Um, so just as background, you know, I think when we wrote that paper, we wrote uh, the typical mobile phone battery is like 1,000 to 2,000 or something milliamp hours. Uh, I just looked at the most recent ones today and like actually there are both 3,000 now on some of the high end phones. So actually battery does, battery size does keep going up. Um, but that's mainly because there's more and more power hungry th things on these phones. The most power hungry thing by far on most phones is just the screens, right? So as the screen gets bigger, um, you you need a bigger and bigger battery. But okay, let's say let's say as a goal we want to consume less than one percent of this battery per day. Uh, if you kind of do the math and say, okay, well, um, I need to run for 24 hours, then you end up with this target of something like 0.4 to 1.25 milliamps. That's basically what your your hot word detector can consume. And I kind of made up this 1% number. There's nothing special. Like if you talk to, uh, you know, if you talk to the team, if you talk to Samsung or any phone manufacturer, they're of course going to say use less than 1%, right? Like we don't, we don't want to spend any, any uh, power on this feature if we don't have to. Um, but okay, let's say 1% is kind of reasonable. Most users might not notice a uh, 1% difference. Um, okay, this is pretty small, right? We need to be around a milliamp, maybe smaller. Uh, the next thing to think about is, 
well, I don't just have to run my algorithm. I actually need to like have the microphone turned on and I need to read audio from it. And that might seem like a very small thing, but when you're talking about this range of under a milliamp, that actually becomes pretty significant and could be potentially most of your power budget actually. Um, so, okay, my, my, my algorithm has to be well, well smaller than a milliamp um, once I factor in also just having the microphone running. Um, so then the first obvious question is, okay, can I just run this on the CPU uh, or what we like, what's often called the application processor, basically where the CPU is. Uh, and I couldn't find anything public on this, but like if you generally, generally in our measurements, you know, it actually depends a lot phone to phone, but it could be anything from tens to even hundreds of milliamps to run something like a typical hot wood detector on the, on, on a typical like ARM CPU. Um, so that's clearly like totally blowing our budget, at least like at least 10 X our budget, maybe hundred X our budget. Uh, so we have to do something else. Um, uh, and that's where this cascade architecture comes into effect. So the, the idea of this cascade architecture is, okay, I'm going to take an always on DSP, which can run at a lower power than the main application processor. And I'm going to run some kind of keyword spotter there. Um, but I'm also, when that thing triggers, I'm going to actually have a second stage keyword spotter and I'm going to do some speaker verification. Uh, and then also actually there's, there's potentially a third stage of verification on the server where it can say, oh, actually everything woke up and you started sending me audio, but it still didn't sound like the hot wood. Um, so let's talk a little bit about this, this system. Like this is actually, if you think about it, a super complex system. Uh, you know, we have this thing on the DSP and we have this thing on the application processor. Um, to be honest with you, like it's a real, it's a real pain to like create, maintain, develop, like scale the system. So the complexity really needs to be worth it. Um, and that's again, something I think you, you often don't see reading academic papers, but something I, I drive home with my team a lot of like, okay, what is the complexity of this? Uh, this system you're building, what is the incremental gain of doing it? If the gain is small and the complexity is high, that's not something I want to be dealing with year after year after year, right? Um, so we think a lot about complexity. Okay, so why is the complexity worth it here? Well, let's first talk a little bit about the DSP. Um, so what are DSPs? Well, these are these um, little processors which were originally created for audio signal processing tasks. So actually they're quite good at doing things like our signal processing front end that we use for Hotwood. Um, quite good at doing things like FFTs, very efficient. Um, in general, like when we started working on this, they weren't particularly well suited for neural nets. That's, that's starting to change over time. But you know, when we started looking at it, uh, they weren't. Um, the, I think the, the most striking thing about DSPs is there's just a huge variety of them. Um, and a huge variety of ways to integrate it into your system. Like if you're building a phone, sometimes you can buy a DSP as part of your SOC. Sometimes you can buy it as an add-on. They're made by a lot of different manufacturers. Each manufacturer will have uh, several different parts they'll sell at different price points. Um, and there's many ways, uh, if they're not actually part of the SOC, not, not uh, many different ways to sort of connect them to the application processor. Um, and you might think, okay, well, maybe these things are like based on ARM or x86 or something, but, but actually no. Uh, these, these in general were custom, custom developed for these signal processing tasks to be very efficient. And um, uh, it's, it's sort of the wild west out there, right? Like there's, there's some manufacturers who are building their own instruction sets. Uh, there are some, uh, so there's some sort of instruction sets that you can license and build your own, build your own chip based on. So there's actually this huge variety. Um, each one is a little bit different. What they do tend to have in common is most of them don't support floating point. Um, so floating point is going to um, uh, need uh, basically increase the size of your, uh, the size of your chip and the price to, uh, the price to make it. And they're often going to have very limited memory. Um, again, memory is going to be very expensive. So anything you add to any memory you add is going to add cost. And it's also, again, going to add to the size. And size and cost are very important. So if I'm building a watch or a phone or earbuds, like I have to cram, I've got to cram everything into a relatively small space and uh, I need to use as little space as possible. And if I'm a phone manufacturer, like, adding a few cents to the price of a part is like 
you know, something a whole team of people will look at of like, how can I reduce this part, the cost of this part by like a few cents? So you might think adding a little bit of memory, not that big of a deal, a few cents here and there, but uh, it's something that phone manufacturers uh, will just look at incredibly closely and, and have a huge downward pressure on price. So yeah, limited memory, no floating point. Um, so you're gonna end up having to do everything with integers or some kind of fixed point arithmetic. Uh, and it gets worse than that in some cases, like on some of these, you don't even have like 32-bit integers. Maybe you only have 24-bit integers and 48-bit integers. So you're kind of in this funny, funny space where you actually have this thing that if you're like me and you're like, you know, generally used to just writing software for, you know, ARM or x86 um, and using like, you know, regular compilers like GCC, uh, you know, this is like a completely different world where you're going to have to be using a specialized compiler, a special instruction set. Uh, sometimes these weird types that aren't even standard, um, standard C types. Okay, so it's challenging, but why is it good? Um, well, there's a, there's a, a few key points. First, these things are designed for signal processing. Uh, so when we build a phone, the audio from the microphone is often already routed directly to them uh, because they're already used for things like when I make a phone call, doing some noise reduction, for example. So the microphones are already kind of going through these. Um, uh, and um, I guess the other, I should say, yeah, the other big thing they're often used for is decoding audio. So like I want to listen to an MP3 on my phone Sometimes actually the MP3 will just be passed down to this thing and it'll decode it, um, uh, decode it for me there again. Because again, that's a task that I need to do with low power. Like uh, I want to be able to listen, listen to music on my phone for hours without running down the battery. So the phone will actually pass down a lot of that processing to this thing. So they're already designed for low power consumption because of that. And they're already designed to pretty much run independently of the application processor. So the application processor can kind of go to sleep or go into a lower power state and this thing can keep chugging along. Um, which, so those are all the properties we need for, for hot work detection. Um, but the key point is, I think, this limited memory. So going back to my diagram, right, like why do I have these two stages? Um, you know, like the most natural thing to do would be, okay, just put my keyword spotter, put everything onto this DSP, right? Uh, don't leave anything on the application processor. But it's the small amount of memory that's really the kicker here. So if I only have, say, 128 kilobytes of memory, um, that's very little memory to stick uh, a full, really good, really well-functioning keyword spotter. So I need this two stages where the first stage can um, be a smaller neural network. It's less accurate, but I can, I can adjust that operating point. So like if we go back to our operating point, that first one, I can adjust the operating point so that it is uh, out here, maybe like 10 pulse accepts an hour, 15 pulse accepts an hour. And, um, you know, these curves are actually from, uh, are actually from a uh, hot word system designed to run on the DSP. So here we are getting down to like under 2% false reject at 10 to, 15, uh, 10 to 15 pulse accepts per hour. So this system is going to over trigger a fair, fair amount, but it's going to have relatively good false reject rate. So the idea is it'll over trigger. Um, which is fine. Um, and then this second stage system, this uh, second stage keyword spotter will take those over triggers and it'll end up rejecting them. So my overall system will still work pretty well. Um, the first stage system could be very small and power efficient, but over trigger a little bit. Uh, and then the second stage system will, will take care of rejecting that. Um, okay, so how are we gonna fit on our DSP? Um, so quantization is one key thing to think about. Um, quantization just means like if my weights are originally um, like 32-bit floats when I train my neural network, uh, I actually going to end up wanting to convert them to say 8-bit integers. Uh, why 8 bits? Uh, well, it's less memory, um, you know, four times less memory. Um, it's going to end up being less compute on a lot of different systems. So I might do the same number, I, you know, I still need to do the same number of multiply and accumulates. Um, but on systems, if you think of something like SIMD, where I have like, a, you know, I have a certain size register and I can do more 8-bit operations in one instruction than I can do 32-bit uh, operations. And it's the same thing on these DSPs. A lot of them are designed to do multiple, multiple, um, multiple multiplies in the same instruction, but you need to be like 8-bits uh, and not 32-bits if you want to take advantage of that. 
Uh, and of course, float, I already said, is, is not even possible on a lot of these because they simply don't support floating point. So you need to go to some kind of integer. Uh, and you, in fact, typically need to do all of your computation. You know, so we're not just storing our weights in integer, we actually need to do all of our computation as integer. Uh, so there's a lot of sort of, I guess, dark magic here to, okay, how do I go from a network that's trained at floating point and convert it to 8-bit integer and still have it work. Uh, sometimes um, you can just take it and convert it and actually you don't lose much accuracy, it works well. Um, sometimes if that doesn't work, you can use what's called quantization aware training, which means as you're, um, as you're training, you basically uh, simulate this quantization so that the neural net uh, weights uh, as we're training, we learn that the neural, neural net weights are going to be quantized and we only allow them to be in these quantized buckets. Um, and, and, then, uh, and then there's basically no conversion necessary. So the model that you trained will be more or less the model that you run on device. Um, luckily, uh, these days, there's, uh, you know, we struggled, struggled for many years figuring these things out. Luckily, these days, TensorFlow has a nice model optimization toolkit that uh, does a lot of this stuff for you. Um, so yeah, going back to memory usage to, um, so just to, you know, we talked about having 128 kilobytes of memory. If you look at it, uh, you actually have a lot less than that available for your algorithm. So uh, the first thing to remember is because we have this two stage system, we actually need some kind of audio buffer, right? So uh, in order to do that validation in the second stage, uh, when the first stage triggers, I need to pass uh, maybe one to two seconds of audio from the first stage up to the second stage and have it run again. Uh, if I have, let's say I have, have two seconds of audio, so maybe a keyword, uh, I think a hot word you typically see maybe around a second, but sometimes it can take people, you know, up to maybe one and a half seconds to say it. Maybe you want a little bit of context before it. So, um, you know, to be safe, you probably want about two seconds of audio, if not more, actually. Um, now, two seconds of audio doesn't sound like much, but at 16 bits, 16 kilohertz, it ends up being 64 kilobytes. Um, again, not a huge number, but that's actually now I've just blown half my memory usage on my audio buffer. Um, uh, okay, so that's my audio buffer. My next biggest thing, it typically turns out, uh, is actually just my code, right? So I have to take the code that I wrote and, you know, turn it into... Um, uh, machine instructions that can run on the on the DSP, um, uh, and I want to write as little code as possible because typically, you know, this varies a lot from architecture to architecture, but you know, typically it could be something like 24 kilobytes just on code. Uh, plus, this red is constants, um, so these constants are basically code as well, like things that uh, um, there's a bunch of constants that things like the FFT algorithm in the front end use, um, and those end up using another good chunk of memory. Um, okay, so that squeezes me down to like this yellow and green section, which is basically what I have for my algorithm. Uh, or, well, actually, basically what I have for, for just, yeah, just doing machine learning. So I have, um, I have my model, which, uh, you know, typically, typically we're going to use maybe around 20 kilobytes for, and then I need a little bit of memory for working memory. So as I, you know, as I'm doing my computations, I'm going to need, uh, you know, just some buffers to, uh, store store things as I do work, right? Um, and again, this comes back to the fun of DSPs, like uh, a lot of them don't have malloc and free, for example, right? So you you might just be given, okay, here, how much memory do you need? You need to maybe decide that when you design your whole system at the beginning, how much memory am I going to get? And then when you start up, the system might just give you a pointer into a big chunk of memory that it's, you know, it's set aside for you. And it's up to you actually to lay out that memory, like where do you want to put your buffers? Do you want to do anything clever? Like, you know, if I have a buffer at one stage of the computation and another buffer later, can I reuse, can I, can I reuse that memory? Like all the wonderful things that malloc and free usually do for you, uh, you kind of end up having to do yourself. Um, okay, so that's- Just a quick interruption. I'm gonna launch a poll because uh, class usually finishes right now, but you're welcome to continue. And for the folks in the class, um, if you need to run for another class, it's fine, but we'll, we'll just kind of finish up. We, we, we're doing very good. We like to be consistent, so we always run late in class, you know? We just <laughs> I did lose track, okay. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, I, you know, I can pretty much finish here if you want. I think I have a lot more material, so. 
Um, no, well, uh, it's fun because I think uh, the, the key point just to talk about the cascade is, uh, you know, if you you need to tune your first stage model so that, like I said, it is high false accept rate, low false reject rate. Um, so this is kind of a, a table that shows, okay, if I have no first stage model and I have a system that has 0.03 FA false lines per hour and 3.1% false reject rate, what kind of cascade do I need to build to get back to this? Um, so if I have a false reject rate on the first stage that's higher than three, um, it'll actually add up with the second stage and I end up going even higher at 5.6. So I need to actually keep going down until my false reject rate is, is actually down to 1.2% and I'm still having a, uh, still not quite back at my original 3.1%. So yeah, I'll just leave it there if you guys wanna, wanna end class. But. I don't know. Um, you can definitely continue, Alex, because the stuff is recorded too, so students can access it afterwards. So. Okay. Are you sure? You want me to go for ten more minutes? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Please do. Okay. And, and the students, if you have a run, it's totally fine. Uh, you can pick up the video later. So. Cool. Um, uh -huh. so yeah, I mean, that's pretty much everything you about Howard. I was going to talk a little bit about uh, speaker verification. I think there was a question about that earlier. Um, Speaker verification is important because if my, you know, like on my phone, like I said, I only want it to trigger for me. Um, so the way that process works is uh, we actually build, um, we build a neural network. Uh, it, um, it produces what are called D vectors, which I'll talk about in a second. But uh, I, I basically need to set up my device and say the hot word like two, three, four times. Um, and we'll run that audio through the neural network and we'll get uh, a D vector out of it uh, and we'll store that for you. And then, you know, when I'm walking around and I want to say, okay, G to wake up my phone, uh, we'll do the same thing. We'll run that audio through the neural network, create another D vector, and we'll just uh, compute something like the, at the simplest level, we could just compute like the cosine distance between these two vectors. And if they're close enough, uh, we'll say it is, it is Alex and otherwise we'll say it's not. Um, okay, but so what is this D vector? I think there's a question about that. Um, I mean, at the simplest le level, you can just think this neural net is, uh, it's kind of, you know, it's not producing a particular output like a yes, no decision or a class. It's actually just producing uh, a set of features, um, uh, maybe 128, uh, maybe, you know, you can choose how many they are, but say maybe 128. And that is what we call the D vector. Now, how do you get it to produce these features? There's some different methods, but like the simplest way, the simplest method, and I think the easiest to think about is if you just train a neural net on, and you show it examples of like me speaking versus someone else speaking, and you have it predict uh, over and over, like, uh, yes, it's the same speaker, or no, it's a different speaker. Um, uh, so you train your neural net with lots of examples to predict that, um, say it works really well, and then you just throw away the final layer that makes that prediction. Uh, the, the second to last layer uh, is basically a, a really smart feature extractor, a feature extractor that's learned to tell the difference between voices. And that is your, your D vector, basically. So it's just the second to last layer in the neural network. So that's speaker verification. Um, you know, talking about practical matters um, and the cascade, I just want to point out, like I said earlier, latency is really important. Uh, when you build this cascade, it actually can really hurt latency because if you think about it, the DSP has to trigger, we need to wake up the application processor, we need to transfer this two second audio buffer. All of those things could potentially take, um, you know, tens or even hundreds of milliseconds. And then I need to run my second stage keyword spotter and my speaker verification system, right? Um, so I have to do all of, the, all of these things after we think the hot word is already triggered. So they're just pure latency added on. Um, so I, I, you know, I want this to be zero. It might be a few hundred milliseconds, uh, but I guess the thing to point out is even with this cascade architecture where we've said, okay, the compute on the DSP is very constrained. Actually, the compute of the second stage is still very constrained as well because we need to run at low, at low latency. Um, so yeah, just a point about the, this final stage on the server. Uh, when we, uh, one thing you can do is send up not just um, you know, one thing you can do is the person says, hey, gee, what's the weather? We could try to just chop and then send up to the server just the what's the weather part. But if we actually send the hey, gee part as well, uh, it has some benefits. So one benefit is like, if I say this really, really fast, 
you know, we talked about car articulation. The way I say the W and what's the weather will actually be affected by the fact that I said, hey, Google. So showing that to the speech recognition system will help it. It's also just an extra chance for us to verify, like, do we really think that the hotwood is there? And, and here we can have this very large speech recognition system to confirm it and pot potentially, potentially reject the utterance if we don't think it contains the hotwood. So yeah, I was just gonna throw in, I talked about Hey Google. Um, if you want, you can go look Sirius published a very nice, uh, very nice blog post where they talk about a lot of very similar things. Um, and one cool thing I thought that they, they talked about, which I didn't talk about here, is that like they look that if you, uh, they look for what they call a, do what they call a second chance. So uh, if you, they, you know, if you say, hey Siri, but uh, it wasn't quite high enough uh, it didn't quite get a high enough score to trigger, but it's over some other lower threshold. They'll actually then like lower the threshold for the next five seconds or something uh, in case you want to say it again. So the idea being like, if I said it once and I missed it, now I can say it again and it'll be easier to trigger. So yeah, thanks. That's all I had. Sorry for going so much over. No, nah, no, nah, this is really good stuff. Thank you for actually all the time and effort you put into putting slides and things like that together. So much appreciate you. Yeah.